My Patreon Alexander Kirscher said, Do you know why the Luftwaffe didn't stop the bombing campaign of the Allies in 1942-1943 by just sending all the interceptors they had to kill a 1,000 bomber raid like Operation Millennium on Cologne? The loss of 1,000 bombers would be much harder, industrial capacity for reproducing them, and more soldiers to man them, than the loss of hundreds of interceptors over their own country. Do I just overestimate the Luftwaffe by assuming they could do that, or was this only a strategic failure in which the Luftwaffe split up its interceptors over the whole of Europe so they were useless everywhere? Why not use the Schwerpunkt in air battles too? Okay, first I just want to apologise to Alexander for taking so long to answer your question. I'll be honest, I procrastinated a little bit on this one because I'm not super well read on the Luftwaffe's defence of the Reich, but I have found the answer. A lot of the information uh, comes from three books, all of which are good reads in my opinion. The first is Murray's Strategy of Defeat, which I'd recommend as probably the most useful uh, source if you want to get more detail on this particular question. The second one is Bomber Boys by Patrick Bishop, which is more from the British perspective, but still pretty useful and well written. And the third one is The Luftwaffe Over Germany by Caldwell and Muller which is another good overview with a greater emphasis on the Germans and the Americans. Starting off, at the beginning of the war, German air defences weren't as good as the British, mainly because the Germans had concentrated on the offence rather than the defence. Instead of fighters, the Germans relied heavily on flak units, especially at first, but even into the late war. And while flak did a lot of damage, they weren't enough to stop the British bombers. Still, Hitler believed that flak guns were a better deal on the defence than fighters because it would provide the population with a psychological boost. I also wonder if the fuel crisis played a part in this because it obviously doesn't take much fuel to run a static anti-aircraft gun. In October 1942, the number of fighter pilot schools was doubled from 5 to 10. Yet, such expansion came at a cost. Fuel shortages began to affect the training program as early as June 1942. Goering noted that if this kept up, the Luftwaffe would have more planes than trained pilots by 1943. With chronic fuel shortages, cutbacks to the duration of the courses were only a matter of time, and the quality of the newly trained pilots suffered. The problem the Germans had was that the British chose to conduct nighttime raids. And it's worth noting that the Germans were behind the British when it came to field airborne radar, and only first put radar in their fighters in the summer of 1942. So they didn't actually have enough nighttime fighters to combat the British nighttime raids. And really, by the time they might have had enough planes fitted with radar, the oil crisis was becoming severe and thus grounded many aircraft. So, in 1940, the German fighters had to rely on searchlights to find their targets and basically fight in the dark, which is stupid. And it was only by late 1941 that the Germans had developed a radar network that could effectively spot where the British bombers were. So this was the first time they could target the British, but they still couldn't really fight them effectively because their aircraft didn't have radar. Worse, because the Germans were fixated on the east at this point, the leadership largely viewed the nighttime raids as a nuisance more than anything else, and did little to improve the situation. And the focus still remained on producing fighters and bombers for the attack, like the Stuka, rather than interceptors for the defence. It was only the raid on Cologne in the May of 1942 that made them realise that they had a problem. This was the first 1000 bomber raid. Now, interestingly, when Bomber Harris took over RAF Bomber Command in February 1942, he believed that the Germans had made a mistake during the Battle of Britain by not concentrating their bombers on one target. So he decided that that's what the British were going to do, focus everything they had on one target. It would be an air Schwerpunkt, if you want to call it that. Effectively, the British out-Germaned the Germans. The principle now was concentration. Henceforth, the pattern was to dispatch as many aircraft as could be mustered against one target. 
Attack times were shortened, which increased the chances of collisions, but reduced the time in which the flak gunners had the bombers in their sights. They were aiming for saturation, swamping the defences and overwhelming the emergency services by sheer weight of violence. Incendiaries were at least as important as high explosive. It was easier to burn down a city than to blow it up. To test out this theory, Bomber Harris first targeted the port of Lübeck on the 28th of March 1942. The results proved him right. 30% of Lübeck's built-up area was destroyed, more than had been estimated. 3,401 buildings, mostly houses, were destroyed or damaged. 320 people were killed, which was still less than the 1,500 killed in London on the 10th of May 1941 by the Luftwaffe, but it was the highest number of kills the British had achieved so far. And Harris only lost 12 bombers out of the 234 that he sent on the raid. So Bomber Harris was most pleased. Rostock was next. On the night of the 26th to 27th of April 1942, the British destroyed 60% of Rostock's town centre. 200 Germans were killed. Another success. Goebbels coined the phrase Terror Angriff, or a terror attack. It's funny that he didn't coin this phrase earlier for places like Coventry, or London, or Rotterdam, or Birmingham, or Liverpool, or Guernica, or Portsmouth, or Cardiff, or Glasgow, or Madrid, or Bristol, or Plymouth, or Veyloon, or Radomsko, or Belfast, or Southampton, or Manchester, or Hull, or Sheffield, or any of the other places that the Luftwaffe had targeted before this point. And this isn't to excuse what the British government did, because they shouldn't have lowered themselves to the level of the German government, but only to point out the hypocrisy of the pro-German outrage. As one German living in America put it, I think of Coventry, and I have no objections to the lesson that everything must be paid for. Did Germany believe that she would never have to pay for the atrocities that her leap into barbarism seemed to allow? Of course, Lübeck and Rostock had been small raids, and Harris wanted to launch a raid that would impress the world. He only had 400 bombers and crews, but he wanted to mount a thousand bomber raid. So he gathered the forces to do that by using every training plane and every crew member he could get his hands on, and borrowed from other services as well. He then launched this first thousand bomber raid on Cologne, Germany's third biggest city, on the night of the 30th to 31st of May 1942. 1,047 bombers dropped 1,455 tons of bombs, two-thirds of which were incendiaries. Unlike the Hanseatic towns, Cologne had wider streets and modern buildings, so the fires didn't have the same effect. Still, the damage was devastating. 3,330 buildings were destroyed, 2,090 seriously damaged, and 7,420 lightly damaged, almost all by fire. The flames devoured 13,010 homes, mostly apartments, and seriously damaged 6,360 more. Nine hospitals, 17 churches, 16 schools, and four university buildings, as well as numerous other premises that could not be considered military or industrial targets, were burnt or blasted down. The only military building mentioned is a flak installation. 411 Germans were killed, mostly civilians, and many more lost their homes or fled the city. George Orwell had this to say on the 6th of June 1942, days after the raid. Cologne was attacked because it is a great railway junction in which the main German railroads cross each other and also an important manufacturing centre. In 1940, when the Germans were bombing Britain, they did not expect retaliation on a very heavy scale, and therefore were not afraid to boast in their propaganda about the slaughter of civilians which they were bringing about, and the terror which their raids aroused. Now, when the tables are turned, they are beginning to cry out against the whole business of aerial bombing, which they declare to be both cruel and useless. The people of this country are not vengeful, but they remember what happened to themselves two years ago, and they remember how the Germans talked when they thought themselves safe from retaliation. 
that they did think themselves safe, there can be little doubt. Here, for example, are some extracts from the speeches of Marshal Goering, the chief of the German Air Force. I have personally looked into the air raid defences of the Ruhr. No bombing planes could get there. Not as much as a single bomb could be dropped from an enemy plane. August 9th, 1939. No hostile aircraft can penetrate the defences of the German Air Force. September 7th, 1939. Many similar statements by the German leaders could be quoted. The reality was that the British could penetrate the defences of the German Luftwaffe. The Germans calculated that they had taken down 37 British aircraft, and they'd actually taken down 40, so this was a rare underestimation by the, the Germans, and thought that they had achieved a 50% success. So the Luftwaffe actually wanted to proclaim a victory. Hitler, though, knew that the damage to Cologne made this a loss, and had a go at Jezenek, the Luftwaffe chief of staff, saying that this was clearly a catastrophe. He also said to Jezenek, I never hide from the truth, but I must see clearly in order to be able to draw correct conclusions. Was this Hitler admitting that he was blind? Well, many would say that Jezenek certainly was. Hans Jezenek, the chief of staff, takes a sometimes deserved beating for the failures of the Luftwaffe in the Second World War. Many sources cite his March 21st, 1942 statement to Milch that he would not know what to do with more than 360 fighters per month. Yet, in this instance, Jezenek was merely reporting the situation as it stood. As a service chief, he was aware that priority in armaments production in 1942 went to army weapons and ships for the burgeoning U-boat offensive, as the Wehrmacht attempted to complete the conquest of the USSR and maintain pressure on Britain's Atlantic lifeline. As much as Milch and Galland disagreed with this policy, the Luftwaffe lacked the fuel, pilots and infrastructure in 1942 to capitalise on a huge increase in fighter production, even if the raw materials and skilled labour could have been made available on short notice. Cologne was the first time the British used the bomber stream tactic. Prior to this, the British bombers had flown over Germany individually to avoid flak. But the German defences in the Kamhuber line were such that there were 74 areas or boxes with two Freya and two Würzburg radars and a control room for night fighters. According to Wikipedia, the greatest source since Tomato, there were two night fighter aircraft assigned to each box, which would be guided to the bombers by the ground controllers. But the bomber stream tactic was basically a bunch of of bombers in tight formation, which simply overwhelmed the German defence system. Rock beats scissors. Two or so night fighters could tackle a lone bomber or two, but couldn't stop hundreds of them. And because the bomber formation was over the target and away very quickly, the Germans couldn't get all their aircraft to the needed area in time before the bombers were away again. You'd think that the Germans would be doomed in 1942, but Murray explains that the British didn't conduct another 1,000 bomber raid again that year. The reason why was because they didn't actually have enough aircraft to do it. They'd robbed from other services to pull it off the first time. In fact, even in February 1943, Bomber Harris only had 600 aircraft. So the Germans didn't learn from this mistake. They didn't increase their defensive measures by much. Had further colognes occurred in 1942, Kamhuber, the guy in charge of the German night fighters, might have received the resources in late 1942 and early 1943 that the night defences received in response to the Hamburg catastrophe of July 1943, which ultimately enabled them to decimate Bomber Command in early 1944. In fact, the Germans only had 180 aircraft in France, although these had some of the best pilots of the Luftwaffe, and 345 aircraft in Germany, and not all of these were night fighters. Reich's Marshal Goering made a most perceptive observation in a conference on May 16, 1942, noting that if enemy bomber units succeeded in penetrating beyond the German fighter defence belt at the Channel coast, there was nothing left in Germany to oppose them. Worse, when the British hit Hamburg, 
German night fighters north and south of the city weren't allowed to attack the bombers even though they could see them. This was because of the way that the Kamhuber defence line worked. They weren't allowed to freelance and had to stay in their zones. Peter Spodden was an 18-year-old student at Hamburg University when the RAF bombed his hometown of Essen in 1940. After the raid, he joined the Luftwaffe with the specific intention of becoming a night fighter pilot. He shared the frustration of the younger pilots at the limitations imposed by the system. He was flying in a box named Orion over Rügen Island when the Great Hamburg Raid went in. I could see Hamburg. I could see the immense fire, and I could also see, closer to me, two or three four-engined planes like moths against the cloud. I told my controller, please let me go, but he did not have any radar reception there. I asked him again, I can see them, I can see them, but he wasn't allowed to go. Even with the self-imposed restrictions on the German fighters, in 1943 the British lost a lot of aircraft during their bombing raids, and so they started to deploy chaff for the first time, also known as window, which I talked about in my Bruneville video, so see that for details. Chaff blinded the entire German defence system and led to some seriously successful bombing raids in mid-1943, including the raids on Hamburg, at little cost to the British bomber forces. Albert Speer warned Hitler that if the British conducted six more attacks on the same scale as Hamburg, it would bring Germany's armament production to a halt. Of course, that didn't happen because the British had been lucky with Hamburg. They had attacked in good weather and had blinded the German defences. But the Germans would recover quickly from this, even allowing their night fighters to leave their boxes if they saw enemy planes, and the British were hurting again by the autumn of 1943. Bomber Command's ability to swamp the night fighter defences of the tightly controlled Kamhuber line led several Luftwaffe officers to suggest radical changes. In late spring, Major Hajo Hermann, a former bomber pilot, pushed a scheme to concentrate a force of day fighters directly over a target and to use searchlights as well as light reflecting from the bombing to attack the bomber stream. Such a tactic, he suggested, would allow night defences to throw a concentration of force at the bomber stream at the point where it was the most vulnerable to visual interception. In a late June report on fighter defences in the West, Mills supported Herman and suggested that the night fighter corps receive responsibility for the night defence over France. Others argued for a more basic restructuring of defences. Erhard Milch was a Luftwaffe field marshal who was basically Göring's right-hand man, and was in charge of aircraft production, amongst other things. Many of the decisions made for the Luftwaffe were made by Milch, as Göring constantly deferred to him. In the end, the Luftwaffe did restructure, and allowed the creation of a night fighter force in Holland, which would move behind the British bomber stream and chase the bombers until the fighters ran out of ammunition or fuel. This tactic was known as Tame Sow, and was effective. However, the Americans also started to get involved in late 1942 and early 1943. And the US approach was different to the British. They wanted to bomb in the day rather than at night, which was a major problem for the Germans. With the Third Reich expanding on all fronts, the daylight defence of German airspace merited only a low priority. The RAF ventured into daylight skies over Germany very infrequently. The Americans also wanted to have their bombers defend themselves rather than rely on fighter escorts. So, the American bombers were flying fortresses, with guns all around them. Again, a major problem for the Germans. The bomber gunners opened fire as soon as a target was seen, in order to disrupt or ward off attacks. The Americans' Browning .50-inch machine guns had a muzzle velocity and a greater range than the German MG-151s and MG-17s. So, the fighter pilots' cockpits were surrounded by red tracers swarming like wasps long before they themselves could open fire effectively. 
And because of the low closing speeds, this extremely uncomfortable situation could continue for several minutes. Some pilots, especially the younger ones, would break away before their own weapons were within effective range. Still, the American bombers suffered heavy losses throughout the summer, at one point losing more bombers than they could replace. This was thanks to both flak and the tenacity of the German fighters, the latter having realised that the American planes were weakest when attacked from the front. But from July 1943, American fighters using drop tanks were able to escort the bombers deep into Germany for the first time, inflicting heavy losses on German fighters. On one early American raid, Oberleutnant Kurt Rupert of 9th Jagdgeschwader 26 repeatedly attacked an isolated B-17. Three engines were shot up, one fell off the plane and crashed into the channel. Out of ammunition, Rupert watched in amazement as the plane continued to fly on one engine, its crew throwing out equipment, guns and ammunition. The bombers succeeded in making it back to England, forced landing on the beach at Ramsgate. The introduction of the US Air Force to the battle made the problem worse for the Germans because the Germans didn't have enough day fighters. So they started to use their night fighters in the daytime too, which was a serious blunder. The use of the night fighters to meet the American threat typified the short-sighted, short-range calculation of much of the Luftwaffe's efforts in the latter period of the war. Night fighter aircraft represented a sizeable investment in terms of equipment, technology, training, and the specialised skills needed by the crews. The commitment of the night force to daylight operations brought with it corresponding high losses. I don't know if the Germans had enough crews to operate some in the day and then some at night, or if the night crews were operating in the day and the night as well. Because if so, when did they sleep? Maybe they were taking drugs to keep themselves awake. But if that is true, then that's not a good idea. The desperate situation seems to have prompted Hitler and Milch to prioritise the defence of the Reich over the forces of the front. So they started pulling back fighter forces from the front, which would speed up Germany's defeat on the battlefield. Goering and others were even coming to the conclusion that night fighters weren't worth the cost of building and Hitler decided to leave German airfields undefended in order to prioritise the defence of German cities. All of this indicates that there just wasn't enough fighters to go around. Worse, the Germans believed that the main threat from the British and American air forces came from the south, so many of their available fighters went south to Italy, Tunisia and Sicily. In other words, Germany was left defenceless, which was why the circa 300 or so fighters she had facing the west couldn't possibly concentrate to hit the incoming bombers. Another factor becomes clear if we look at the raid on the Romanian oil fields in August 1943. When that raid began, the Axis were alerted to the incoming bombers in time, and were able to send up their fighters and get their flak units ready before the bombers hit. Thus, the Americans lost 30.5% of their bomber fleet, and the Axis were able to repair the damage pretty quickly. But then, a few days later, the same bombers who had participated in the oil fields raid were sent to bomb an aircraft plant in Austria. They caught the Germans by surprise, inflicted a lot of damage, and only lost two aircraft. So, the element of surprise was a vital factor. And that was during the day. So you can imagine what it was like at night. If the Germans were surprised, then there's no way they could get all their fighter forces to the area they needed in time. There are other factors. Until August 1944, both day and night fighter operations were split between two separate commands due to Goering's mismanagement. They had production issues and massive amounts of attrition of both planes and skilled pilots. The Luftwaffe's chief of staff, Jezenek, responded to the stress of all of this by putting a gun to his temple on the 18th of August 1943. Milch was campaigning to change tactics, but failed to persuade Hitler or Goering that there was a problem. 
They kept producing bombers and rockets to strike back at Britain, while Germany's fighter forces were being ground into dust. In February 1943, after Milch urged the inclusion of more women in the production process, Goering suggested that perhaps the best method to include women in the war effort would be to allow them to do the work at home, where they would also be able to watch their children. A somewhat flabbergasted Milch could only reply that German industry was more advanced than that. In terms of losses, the US 8th Air Force lost the most bombers in a single month for the whole war in April 1944. From that point onwards, the losses declined. In May 1944, the Luftwaffe lost 50.4% of their single-engined fighter aircraft and 25% of their BF-109 and Fokker Wolf 190 pilots, a loss of 2,262 pilots. The Germans reacted by starting to pull pilots away from the already depleted wings on the front lines, cutting training hours, and they threw pilots directly into combat against Allied air forces rather than the less skilled Red Army Air Force as they had previously done. By the time of the Normandy invasion, the Luftwaffe in France was basically non-existent, and most of the ground support aircraft were in the east, meaning that the German fighters would have to attack the Allied forces as fighter bombers, which most of them were not trained to do because of the cut-in training hours. They were planning on bringing up extra fighters for the invasion, but because they misread the weather, <laughs> they didn't do this for the 6th of June, so they then had to scramble to send their fighters west once the invasion had occurred, which was a difficult logistical task because many of the remaining airfields in the west weren't prepared for the aircraft. Then, when they did go into combat, or when they did try to be fighter bombers, they were swarmed by Allied fighters. Even when they ordered all their fighters to operate like fighters, the Allies still had complete superiority, and the Germans were forced to defend their own airfields. This is reflected in the numbers. From June 6th to June 30th, the RAF and Americans flew 130,000 sorties in support of the invasion. The Germans flew 13,829. Worse, a lack of fuel forced the Germans to ground their long-range bombers, and they now faced six Soviet aircraft for every aircraft they had in the east. By the end of July 1944, there were almost no fighters left to defend the Romanian oil fields. And by the middle of August, there were only 75 operational fighters in the west, forcing them to fall back to German airfields in September. Finally, on the 2nd of November 1944, 1,174 Allied bombers, escorted by 968 fighters, targeted the German fuel industry, bearing in mind the Romanian oil fields were now in Soviet hands. The Germans sent up 490 fighters, of which only 305 actually attacked the bombers. The Germans lost 120 fighters and only took out 40 bombers. With the fuel situation critical and Allied planes now based in France, there was nothing left. So, to answer Kirsch's original question, the reason why the Germans didn't just send up all their fighters at once was because, at first, their defences relied heavily on flak, not fighters, and their fighters were spread out to catch the odd British bomber or two that were flying through their lines. But the British changed tactics and started using bomber streams, and the Germans were slow to react, and it wasn't until the British deployed chaff that the Germans were compelled to change tactics. By then, they were on the back foot in terms of production, aircraft shortages, fuel shortages, pilot shortages, and American bombers had also appeared in the skies. The combination of all these factors meant that the Germans didn't have enough fighters to actually accomplish a Schwerpunkt. Thus, they started pulling aircraft and pilots back from the fronts to defend the Reich and form larger groups, speeding up Germany's defeat on the battlefields. Worse, they never actually had enough of the fighters or pilots, and what they did have only delayed the inevitable. 
the deterioration of the Luftwaffe became more acute as they were gradually overwhelmed, disintegrating in the face of Allied numerical and technical superiority. Hope that answers your question. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.